looks like we got a great audience for tonight. So I will go ahead and get us kicked off and start the webinar. All right, so welcome to the knowns and unknowns of myopia management and other cool stuff in optometry. And this is brought to you by the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control and also GP Specialist. GP Specialist is 100% dedicated to OrthoK and has one of the world's largest portfolios of OrthoK lenses. We thank them for their support. And I'd also like to say thank you to Contamac for underwriting a portion of today's program. Optimum is one of the most popular lens materials in the market. And before we get started, I want to add that the opinions and viewpoints expressed tonight do not necessarily reflect, reflect the AAOMC or the sponsors or myself. And this is episode six of our series. This is the final part of what could be season one. I don't know. It, we'll see how it goes. Uh, and we have two sections for tonight's uh, episode. Our first section is a panel discussion, which is practicing myopia management from a pediatric perspective. And then we have an awesome clinical corner coming up with Dr. Shelby Leach. All right, so let's get to our introductions. So if our panelists want to uh, turn on their microphones and their cameras, and I'll start by introducing Dr. Nate Benia Warford. Dr. Benia Warford received his doctorate of optometry from Illinois College of Optometry located right here in Chicago, Illinois in 2004. The following year, he completed a residency program specializing in pediatric and binocular vision at the Illinois College of Optometry. During his optometric internships, he studied developmental vision in Denver, Colorado, and contact lenses and ocular diseases in Chicago. Uh, owing to his passion for improving the vision of children, Dr. Benia Warford has published articles on such topics as the use of vision therapy. Uh, let's see, I'm sorry, just closed vision therapy to improve reading skills and has lectured to optometry students and paraprofessionals as well as the general public on visual care of children, the importance of vision in personal development and options for controlling nearsightedness. Dr. Nathan Benia Warford, welcome to the program. Thanks. I'm so happy to talk about this uh, subject with everyone. Awesome. All right. Next, we have Dr. Ashley Tucker. Dr. Ashley Tucker graduated from the University of Florida with a Bachelor of Science degree in microbiology and cell science in 2006 before going on to graduate from the University of Houston College of Optometry in 2010. Dr. Tucker completed a cornea and contact lens residency at the University of Houston, where she received extensive training and experience in the diagnosis and treatment of corneal diseases in complex contact lens fits. Uh, during her residency, Dr. Tucker also developed a passion for myopia management and has been dedicated to creating custom programs for her myopic patients for her entire optometric career. Dr. Ashley Tucker, welcome to the program. Thank you, Matt. All right. And I am Matthew Herzberg, and I'll be your host and moderator for tonight's panel. And so, all right. So what I wanted to kick us off with is, uh, you know, I discovered in our, our pre-show, we always do a prep show for our webinars. And what I love about our panelists tonight is they have two very different practices, but there's very common themes between them. Uh, and both of our doctors uh, specialize in pediatric patients. So I want to start off by getting each of our panelists to tell us a little bit about their practice. I want to start with Ashley Tucker. So Ashley, tell us about your practice. Your practice uh, is, is like a high-end, um, correct me if I'm wrong, more boutique experience. It, uh, would that be accurate? That would be very accurate. So we are in Houston, Texas. So we have a kind of a dual name to our practice. It's Bel Air Family Eye Care, which focuses on um, just the entire family, just like the, the name sounds. And then we have a sub practice within the practice called the Contact Lens Institute of Houston, which uh, mainly focuses on patients with specialty contact lens needs and myopia management. Uh, but we are a five doctor, all female practice. So we have a, a very uh, glitz and glam type of feel to, to our practice. Uh, we, 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 we aren't a true concierge practice, but the vibe in our practice is certainly that. Gotcha. And uh, Dr. Nate, uh, why don't you tell us about your practice? So uh, we have two locations here in Tampa, Florida. Uh, we have our, our primary location, uh, Bright Eyes Family Vision Care, which treats um, all ages, uh, you know, from in infants all, all the way up, uh, although about half of our patients there are children. And then where I spend most of my time is Bright Eyes Kids 
and that's exclusively pediatric, uh, with the exception of some uh, adults who require uh, vision therapy services. So we, we will see them there. Um, but it, it's entirely uh, pediatric primary care, uh, vision therapy, and myopia control. And it's a, uh, it's a smaller uh, office. It's a little slower pace, but uh, from, from the beginning to end, it's entirely uh, pediatric focused. Gotcha. And, and one of the things I want to point out is that um, Nate has mentioned to me before I had him on the Corrected View podcast. And at this, uh, you know, uh, pediatric specific practice, Nate, you'll have adults who will say, wow, this is great. I love what you're doing for my kid. I'd like to set up an appointment with you at this location. And you're like, well, we don't do adults here. You know, we don't see adults here. So is that true? You turn away adult patients? Um. Absolutely, and it's it's challenging to 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 turn away or to not not book patients. Uh, the way we handle handle that is we'll either uh, encourage them to go to our family practice, but it's 17 miles away, so it's a it's a little. Uh, we understand why uh, patients uh, wouldn't want to do that. Uh, so then we will refer them to uh, practices that see adults in the area who we have a great referral relationship with. Uh, you know, when we find that that uh, that that works really well. And Ashley, um, as a boutique practice, uh, I, I, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm not envisioning that you guys are specifically advertising pediatrics. So uh, like, I want to start with you, like, how did you get into pediatric myopia management? Did it just kind of like fall into your lap or, or like, how did that start out for you? Sure. So I failed to mention that we have a third branch of our practice that's fully uh, vision therapy. So that's the root of our practice. It's a family practice, primary care with vision therapy. So when I joined the practice 10 years ago, at that point, it was already 50% pediatrics, um, not at all focusing on myopia management. So thankfully, I had the patient base there. I just needed to bring the skill and the knowledge to um, start the myopia management program. But I, I tell parent, uh, uh, my colleagues all the time that you don't necessarily have to have children in your practice to get started with myopia management. You have an entire population of, uh, of adult myopes that have children. And you just mm -hmm. have to let those, those parents know that you want to see their kids and you want to make an impact on their future. Definitely. And, and Nate, um, do you have a specific, I mean, I see you on TikTok. I see you on social media <laughs> all the time. Do you have a, spe you have a specific program devoted to drawing in pediatric patients? Uh, you know, absolutely. We're always trying to, uh, Think of new ways to uh, engage, uh, you know, patients, uh, parents, uh, you know, children uh, directly, you know, if we can, and you know, and and, um, and that is both vision therapy uh, and and myopia control. Kind of like Ashley said, um, you know, I had just finished my vision therapy re uh, res residency when we started this practice, so I was like totally focused on vision therapy, you know, in the very beginning. And it was only after um, parents started asking me for myopia control services that I realized like, oh, I really have to, I have to offer this. If I'm <laughs> going to be a pediatric specialist, I can't be a partial pediatric specialist. I need to be fully, you know, fully versed in, in pediatric vision. And that, uh, that includes you know, myopia control. And so that's how I got in, into this you know, and that was, you know, that was about 15 years ago now. And, um, you know, and it's, it's become, uh, you know, the, the most exciting thing in the practice, I think. I agree. Gotcha. Ashley, uh, you agree. Like, what is your experience uh, becoming like, okay, so here's what I, here's the kind of the picture I want to paint is okay. that, you know, every person, every optometrist who I talk to, who is just starting out, doesn't realize, or at least it, it isn't obvious to them that, the experts such as yourself and, and Nate, you guys were once in their shoes. And so uh, how did you become a pediatric myopia management specialist? Sure. So it started with my love. I mean, love and obsession for ortho -K. I absolutely fell in love with it during my, my residency. And I wasn't just doing it for myopia management. Really, I wasn't doing it for myopia management much at all. I was doing it mostly on adult patients. And then, you know, as time went on, I realized the value that it played in the myopia management world. So that's how it started for me with ortho -K. But then I quickly realized in practice that there's a significant number of patients and parents that want nothing to do with corneal reshaping. They think it's some hokey pokey weird science. 
So then I had to realize, okay, I, I, I love what ortho K is doing for my patients, but I want to reach a broader, broader audience. So then that's when I started thinking outside of the box with soft contact lenses. I mean, that, and that was back when this was off label. Now we have soft contact lens options to us that are FDA approved. So I think this is the best time ever to start practicing myopia management become it's become so approachable. It's so it's, it's very easy to start. We're just fitting soft contact lenses. And I don't mean to downplay that, but it's much less complicated than fitting ortho K. And it, are we in a, like a, a new golden age for ortho K and myopia management because parents are more educated? Is it because, you know, due to the lockdown and the pandemic, kids are in front of computers even more than they were before. Mm -hmm. Like, what do we owe to this new era that everybody, everybody says to me, like, this is about to blow up and become super mainstream for optometry. Um, uh, so what do you think? I, I totally agree. I mean, we're hyper aware. Everyone is hyper aware of what screens and this digital age is doing, what the impact it's having on our, on our kids. Um, so yes, it is, it's an amazing time to be practicing. And I want to say one, one thing about um, just ortho-K and myopia management, just starting just in general. It only takes one. I, I read somewhere and I wish I could find the reference, but for every one ortho-K patient, they refer four, four to you. Mm. And that is true. I mean, that may even be downplaying a little bit. So just start with one, <laughs> start mm -hmm. with, with one. And that person will explode your myopia management uh, journey. I, I, I know that it will. I, it, it really just takes getting in, starting being a, a little cavalier and just, just getting in the trenches. Nate, do, would you agree with that? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know what the positive version of a perfect storm is. I guess, I guess it's just synergy, but but that's the way, that's where I feel like we are right now. The, the combination of uh, the increased um, concern that parents have, you know, due to the pandemic, that, that's been growing steadily for the last 10 years, but it's really kind of come to a head now because of the pandemic, as well as the increased sort of penetration of a uh, discussion of myopia just in the lay press, not only in, in, the, in the clinical trade press, but just, you know, in, in, the, in the lay press. And then you factor in um, the commitment that industry has right now. If you think about the individual uh, companies, you know, and, and the amount of uh, uh, effort and resources and money that they are, are putting into this and, you know, and that, um, includes organizations like like GMAC, the the Global uh, Myopia Awareness Coalition, and, and, and other you know organizations, you know, and then and last but not least, the amount of research that's going into myopia right now. I mean, it used to be like months would go by before we would have any sort of new data to sort of analyze, and now you know we have a whole. Uh, you know, the review of myopia management, literally every day, every day, thing <laughs> exactly to think about every single morning, you can kind of like, oh, I should think about that. Or I should, tweet yeah. this, or, I should mm -hmm. do that. Or I should share this or post that or, you know, and, um, you know, so, so all of those factors together, you know, just it, is it's extremely invigorating. It's extremely, mm -hmm. uh, it's extremely I exciting because, um, you know, um, it's like going to vision by design, uh, you know, the, the meeting that, you know, you guys are very you know, familiar with, and I encourage all the, all the uh, listeners and viewers to, to go to, but it's like doing that a little bit every day, you know, mm -hmm. because there's just so much information out there now. Um, and so all of those things together, I just think it's an incredibly uh, exciting time. And how does uh, practicing pediatric myopia management differ from traditional myopia because like now everyone's like, look, if you want to do myopia management, you got to see kids. So, so what, what is the, Ashley, what is the comparison from tr what is traditional myopia and how does uh, pediatric myopia management differ from that? Yeah. So traditional myopia to me is what I used to equate to just being nearsighted, just, you know, having a difficult time seeing far, um, being able to see up close. And then we're just updating a prescription for the, for the present time. Now it's a journey. It's a long-term, you know, I don't want to say lifelong, but it's a long-term investment in our patients, um, parents investing in their children. It's, it's a much broader picture now. It's, it's not just fixing their vision. It's potentially saving them from 
detrimental impacts on, on their visual system, on their, on, on their eyes, on their life. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a lot more impactful now when we talk about myopia management instead of just talking about simply treating a patient's vision. Gotcha. All right, let's, let's talk about the difference in the environment, the practice environment. And Nate, let's, uh, I'm going to kick it over to you because um, your practice is, you know, you have a, a kids only practice. So what is the one thing that I do want to mention is the similarity between both of these uh, specialists is that they are high energy when it comes to their patients. Their staff is high energy when it comes to their patients. So I want to mention that specifically, but I also want to talk about what other differences in the environment of your practice, Nate, we'll start with you. So what is what are you doing in the environment of your practice that's different from the uh, standard myopia management practice? Well, so... So in one way, uh, a lot of the things that we have in the practice is an outgrowth of sort of the, the vision therapy roots. So, so one of the things, you know, we have, we have lots of decorations and we have lots of things that are sort of, in, you know, in, in encouragement. We've got um, uh, athletes who have done uh, either sports vision training or you know, vision therapy. We've got pictures of them. We have something called the success tree, which is this big tree and people have their handprint and, uh, you know, their age and the year that they graduated from vision therapy. We have the superstar myopia wall, or myopia control superstar you know, wall, which has got their image and they're doing something that's important to them, you know, and, and so, so there's a lot, there's this energy, like you said, that sort of, I think, pervades the whole environment, but it's definitely on a smaller scale. So we literally have, you know, kindergarten size desks and kindergarten size seats. We also have grown up size seats and you know, teenager <laughs> you know, size seats. Uh, we have one whole wall that is nothing but um, children's art that has been donated to us or you know given to us. And it's everything from framed really, really nice pieces to we have um, just like a, a, a cord where we use paper clips and just hang like the scribbles that the kids do with crayons and, you know, hang, hang that out up there. So people can feel like they're like contributing a part to the practice and engaging. Um, and we have lots and lots of little subtle, like Legos and minions and little things that are around. I've even toyed with the idea of having a scavenger hunt that we could like get on our webpage <laughs> where they're like, you know, you know, find the minion and which which three birds are made of, you know, Legos and blah, blah, blah. I actually don't want to do that because I don't want to encourage them to just mill around and be, be, but it's such a cool idea because we absolutely could do that because that's the kind of environment that we, you know, we've tried to, to, to build with the entire goal of making the patient, the child feel comfortable because if they're comfortable and if they're relaxed, that's the very first step in, having them develop trust you know, in us in this relationship that we need to develop in order to um, help them long term. Like Ashley said, you know, it, the old traditional method is a very short term. OK, we need you to be able to see right now. OK, we're done. Transactions over. They can go their way. We can go our way. That's kind of the end. Whereas myopia control is a long-term process that requires develop of a strong relationship between the patient and the parent and the doctor. And, and so having this environment, at least for us, I think is, is a good first uh, you know, step in, in developing that. All right, Ashley, like what kind of environmental differences do you have in your practice? I know you're a huge ad, uh, proponent of the myopia uh, management advocate in your practice. Oh, yeah, yeah. And staff is a huge part of uh, mm -hmm. what makes your system work. So what describe your practice environment? Sure. So I don't think it could be any different, any more different, excuse me, from, from Nate's. I mean, we have glittery wallpaper, like not really not kid friendly, but very <laughs> nice, sparkly um, things in our practice that it creates a concierge feel. And I keep referring to that word because that's what myopia management is to me. It's in my practice. Um, it's an elevated level of care. So we don't have anything really in our practice that's specific to children. I mean, we, like you mentioned, we have a high energy staff. It's a requirement for, to be hired that you have experience with work, working with kids or you're willing to learn to work with kids. And if you prove that you are not, we're going to move you to a different department or let you go. I mean, it's important that 
our team members can connect with our with the children. Um, but our approach is just getting down to their level, spending custom time with them, uh, me meeting them where they're, where they're at in, in topics and conversation. Um, it's, it's more of a relationship that we've created instead of necessarily an environment. Um, circling back to the advocate situation, I, you want to talk about that, that now? Is that a good time? Sure. Okay, so we're a very, very busy practice. So five doctors, usually three or four of us are working at any given time. We have a staff of 30. So we have a lot going on. So I don't always have the time to dedicate an hour to a conversation that really probably needs about an hour. So I give all that I can, but I have a trained myopia management advocate that is in the room with me and ready to receive the baton whenever I'm willing to give it. Um, she can de deliver the myopia management spiel just as good as I can, if not better. Um, so she will have the conversation about um, all the options that maybe I didn't cover or to go more in depth on the option that the patients are most interested in, and then have that kind of uncomfortable uh, cost <laughs> conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm more than capable of doing it. I'm willing to do it, but I am not sad when I don't have to. Right. Um, you know, when we go to the dentist, they put you into a very specific room and someone else talks to you about the price of braces and fillings and that sort of thing. So we kind of equate it to that and it's worked really, really well for our practice. But no matter what, I always circle back, answer any last minute questions and then, you know, kind of close that connection with the patient and the parents. Yeah. And I, I love the myopia management uh, advocate. I, I, um, the more I hear about it, the more doctors I talk to that have one, I think it's a great idea. A game changer. Right? Yeah. And, and that's what I hear from a lot of optometrists who do myopia management. And it's like, you know, um, you know, a lot of optometrists are uncomfortable with talking about price mm -hmm. and other details. And it, I, I, like you said, it's not that you can't do it, but it's like, you know, shouldn't your time be better focused right. on offering on the doctoring. best quality? Yeah, right. exactly. On being, right. I'm being the, the uh, specialist. So why not hand that over? Nate, do you have a, a similar advocate or how do you incorporate your staff into your practice? Um, so, yeah, I, I think um, when I talk to people who are newer to, to myopia control, um, you know, two things that I, I tell them, you know, right off the bat. Um, one is, you know, identify uh, one of your staff people, and they, they could be a, a, a scribe who's really, really good with patients. It could be an optician, but develop, you know, identify somebody in our office. Uh, you're, they're, they're called the myopia, you know, coordinator. And, and, and they, except for the doctoring, like Ashley said, you know, in the exam room, they literally could do everything you know, about the entire, you know, program, which is great because if I go on vacation, you know, I don't have to worry that everything is falling, you know, falling through the cracks. So I would say identify um, one, at least one um, person who everything that you learn, everything that you're thinking about as you're building the program, as you're developing uh, internal marketing pieces, as you're making decisions, they're um, part of that so that they intuitively know, you know, how to, how to answer those questions. And then the other part that I, I, I tell people is, you know, if you're going to make this a priority, schedule it like a, like it's a priority mm -hmm. block time off because it's impossible. It's not impossible. It's hard <laughs> to squeeze in, you know, these types of appointments. So, so block time off, make that time specifically for this. If you don't have a person with you right that moment, then use that time with your advocate or use that time for marketing or do something else. And you'll be amazed at how quickly that time gets filled up with paying patients who, who want this service. Mm -hmm. Ashley, do you agree with that? And then if you do, like, what do you do if you're just starting off and you're having trouble filling that time slot? I think there's a lot of pressure from an optometrist who mm -hmm. is like, you know, that time slot could be filled with like uh, an emergency case or a canceled appointment or whatever the case may be. What do you, you think? Mean, you mean a time slot for like a consultation? Is mm -hmm. that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your you flexibility is the name of the game. So for me, I do have set times on my schedule that are for, let's say, scleral fits, myopia management consults. My team knows two days before, if that's not filled, you fill it with something else. I mean, we're not mm -hmm. going to let that just sit there. Mm -hmm. So yes, I totally agree with Nate. I think consultation visits are incredible. It is concentrated time just to talk about our favorite topic, myopia <laughs> management, instead of rushing and trying to get 
the dilation, the, you know, the refraction, all of that, the binocular vision assessment, there needs to be, those visits need to be separated if at all possible. And one thing I thought about Nathan and I talked about yesterday with you too, Matthew, is your advocate, your best advocate is someone who's either in ortho K, that would be great, or has a child that is in some sort of myopia management program that's been successful. I personally don't have that. That's like my goal. Nathan, you, you mentioned that yesterday, but I wanted to bring that up. Fit, fit someone's child and that, you couldn't ask for a better advocate than that. Especially if that's your staff, right? Your, right, your front that's what I mean. Yes, yeah, someone on your team. And we actually have had, um, we've had um, patients, uh, okay, the parents of successful like vision therapy kids and myopia management kids want to come and work in our practice just yeah. to serve in that role. So you'd be surprised. You might get some good team right. members by, by fitting their kids. The, the, you can't, the, the best thing you can do for a person is do something wonderful for their child. You will not get them to stop talking about what you've done. That's a great point. That's a great point. And, and, and Nate, um, you know, when it, I want to talk about, I want to move uh, us into, you know, tips for talking to parents, you know, um, and, and, and Nate, correct me if I'm wrong, but you almost go directly to the kid uh, on that initial uh, exam or consultation. Is that correct? I'm not saying you just ignore the parents, but I think a big part of this is like, what, like when I was a kid at the doctor's office, mm -hmm. like I just waited for my turn to tell the doctor like what was wrong or, or what, how I felt about it. But, uh, you know, I think engagement with the kid is, is key here. Would you agree with that? Um, I mean, more than agree with it. I think it's it's kind of uh, the corner, cornerstone of the uh, of how how we build that relationship with patients. And depending on their age, there's lots of different things that we, that we'll do. Like you just said, the very first time I come in the exam room and I've read up on their chart and I know what's going on, um, I will I will literally just not even acknowledge the parent at first, and I'll mm -hmm. go right in and I'll make eye contact with the patient. I'll give them like a fist bump. I'll talk to them about like what's on their shirt. If they have a shirt that's like a video game or, you know, a, a book character, you know, or something. And I'll kind of, you know, find out what's going on with that. If they're little, I will literally very, you know, first thing, just raise their chair up so that we're literally kind of talking, uh, you know, at the same, at the same level. Uh, I do this thing, which kind of was an, originally in sort of an outgrowth of spatial awareness, but I have, it's like a little game where they have to touch the, uh, the Lang cube, but I do it in this sort of silly way. And it never fails to kind of get a smile out of them because we're doing this kind of ridiculous, uh, goofy kind of activity. And they don't expect to do that in like a medical kind of, you know, environment. And so that sort of, you know, breaks the ice. There's a zillion different things which you just develop over time. But that's where, you know, you just learn, you know, after seeing, you know, seeing these patients and trying to make their, their experience uh, you know, uh, kind of delightful, you know, to them. And then it, you know, and then it, it builds from there. Now, when it comes to the consultation, then I'm engaging the kid and I'm sort of like checking in with them, but it is all about the, the, the parent <laughs> mm -hmm. and understanding what their current level of uh, awareness and what, you know, what, what they sort of believe to be true so that I can say things that I think are moving the conversation forward, but in a way that they can actually uh, take in, what they can actually like assimilate and, and act on. Um, certainly if I feel like they are already sort of, I mean, we all know these, some parents, just the fact that their child needs glasses is like way over the line. They're like, no way, like not my kid, like, uh-uh. You know, you know, so if they can't even handle that, they are contacts not an ready. option at all at that point, <laughs> probably not. Right. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? So, so, but that's the thing is it takes being aware. It, it, it takes being aware of how engaged that parent is, you know, um, throughout the whole exam. So even though my attention is on the child, my awareness is on, you know, on, on the, the, the parent and, and that sort of give and take happens throughout the whole uh, exam and consultation. All right. And Ashley, a similar question for you, but I also want to add, um, cause you do like a customized, uh, a plan for the mm -hmm. patient and, and, and I'm sure that revolves around their parents and, and, you know, we talked uh, ab about, um, you know, presenting information to the parent. And I think there's a lot of 
pressure on the optometrist to be like, this is really important. And I almost want to scare you into <laughs> doing myopia management because this is really important. Uh, what are your experiences with transmitting that information to the parents? Yeah. So I would love to say that I have this down pat. I really would, but it's, it evolves every day with every patient experience. And kind of like Nate alluded to, you, you really have to meet the family and the parents wherever they are, wherever they are, excuse me, on their myopia journey. So I give as much as I feel like they can digest, but what has been the most impactful thing for me is to hand them a myopia management packet that my advocate, based on the conversation, based on the prescription, she knows exactly what to go pull. So I have a general FAQ that I've written about myopia and the, the advantages of myopia management. And then I have specific brochures and information about the options that they have for their particular child. So all that gets put into a packet. I give as much again as I think they can handle, but I'm sending it home with them. And either myself or my advocate will reach back out in a week, um, maybe less. We, we'll, we'll set a time that we're going to reach back out to see if they have any additional questions. Most of the time, they've already scheduled though a consultation. So it really is, that has been the single most important thing and most impactful thing that's happened in my practice. It's just giving get, them. If I can get just a little bit, you know, wonky here. And uh, one thing that I, I think that uh, not everybody wants to do, but is I encourage everybody who's listening to do is just get really, really familiar with whatever abilities your uh, EMR has to personalize documents, mm -hmm. because one, it's just super efficient. Um, you know, I mean, in, in just a few clicks, I I can uh, have a letter that's written uh, to the referring doctor. You know, we have a, a, a lot of uh, optometrists, you know, in the area who, who know, you know, they've already done um, dilated fundus exam. They've already, you know, done, done all of these things. And then they're referring them to me specifically for, for myopia control. And so within just a few clicks, that's personalized with all the exam findings. And then that can get sent directly to the referring doctor, as well as, uh, educational documents. And, and I feel like it takes forever to get that done. Like it's so tedious to get those things set up correctly, but once they do, it's so great because one, it saves a lot of time, but two, because it saves a lot of time, those things are much more likely to actually get done <laughs> and not fall through the cracks or get missed. And you don't want to do that if you want to do this well, you want to have a reputation for being an excellent communicator, both in person, you know, and you know, verbally, but also uh, also written, and and that's just too time consuming to be able, you know, to do that um, from scratch every time. Ashley, do you agree with that? I do. I mean, I I like having my advocate do it for me, but if you're one person show and your EMR can you can click and print. Definitely take advantage of that for sure, for sure. You know, I want to take a question from the audience, uh, which has to do with consultation. If you guys have questions for our two experts, please get them in uh, ASAP so we can uh, get them answered. But do you do y'all ch uh, charge for your consultation? Mm. Uh, Ashley, let's start with you. Do Good you charge question. for your consultation? Okay, I've gone back and forth, back and forth, back and forth on this. Initially, yes, I did because I was doing a lot of consultations. Mm. Um, that ended up not converting. But now I don't. I feel like our conversion mm -hmm. rate is good enough. You win some, you lose some, but we win a lot more than we lose. So the consultation in my practice is a free service um, only because it, the conversion rate is so high now. We've, we've gotten mm -hmm. our consultation down to a science. And most people that are getting to the consultation are really interested, really wanting to create some sort of um, package for their child. That's awesome. Nate, do you, uh, do y'all charge for consultations? So we, we've done it both ways. Um, we do charge. Um, one reason is, um, when we didn't charge, I found that I was getting more, um, people who were not good candidates or there were people who it wasn't really appropriate for, or they didn't really understand what they were asking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just felt like 
there were, you know, maybe that maybe it would be better now. You know, that was a while ago. Maybe maybe, maybe things would be, you know, significantly better now. Um, the 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 caveat, I guess, is uh, assuming that they they do the the consultation, um, they can apply. They not can. They do apply. Mm -hmm. It's applied that fee towards whatever whatever program they get. So in the end, it's not. They don't pay for it, but um, you know, I just nowadays. I mean, I'm I'm so so busy between vision therapy and myopia control and the you know the pediatric primary care, you know the the accommodative isotropes and the amblyopes and you know and all that stuff. It's just really hard for me to wrap my head around, even though I understand why, um, doing it for free. <laughs> Gotcha. So I don't. <laughs> All right, let's take another question. Uh, can you talk about fees? Uh, I.e., do you have one for myopia management, whether it's uh, my site or some other soft uh, contact lens, ortho K or atropine drops? Is the fee different for follow up years? So, do you do one fee or do you have multiple fees without going into any numbers? I don't want to mm -hmm. get anybody in trouble. Mm -hmm. Ashley, let's start with you. What do you think? Yeah, so it's very complicated, but yes, I have a specific fee for my site that the, the first year is one fee and the subsequent years are a little bit more they're at a reduced rate just because the management piece is the, the discussion is much less complicated in subsequent years so i feel like my chair time is much less significant orthokeratology definitely have a set fee for that um, and then subsequent years cost less as well. And then what I consider off-label, the other type of soft contact lens designs that I that I utilize, those have a separate fee as well. And then atropine, it, it, everything has a separate fee with subsequent years less expensive. Gotcha. And, and Nate, what do you think? Um, we did it that way for a, uh, a very long time. Um, so much so that, you know, uh, ortho K had different levels of fees and, um, you know, uh, this is kind of before my site. And so multifocal contact lenses would have their fees. And um, the part that bothered me the most about that whole situation is I felt like very often parents would ask before they saw me or after they saw me, um, okay, which of these programs is the cheapest? And that's the one that I want, totally independent of whatever I thought clinically was most uh, appropriate, you know, for their their child. And um, and I kind of wanted to de-emphasize the the monetary part of it. Um, so what we did is they either do the myopia program or they don't. And the first year is one fee regardless of which track they go in, or even if they start in one track and they switch to, to another one. Now there is a fee if they combine tracks, but that's not totally common, although it's becoming more common. Um, the, the, the nuance there is the, the following years, it is different depending on which track they're in, you know, mostly because, you know, cost of goods is very, mm -hmm. very different for for the different um, for the different services, and it also depends on you know if they're in ortho K and they've been very successful for four years, but now I need to redesign them. Well, that's a lot more work than if you know if I don't. So it does get a little bit more complicated after the first year. But first year, it's all one fee. They either do it or they don't. Gotcha. This is a slight tangent. I just have a quick question for Nate. Do you have a myopia management contract that you have patients? sign or you go over with them in detail about dropping out switching programs combining programs yes and that is a work in progress Me too. too because as we you know <laughs> as we do it and now we're 18 months with one patient and you know 36 months with another patient and we sort of see these little scenarios that come up we're like oh, okay we should probably have a blurb about that mm -hmm. we should probably have a mm -hmm. so it's evolved it's evolved but okay. uh, you know we do and and I have actually um, a sticky note on my my desk right now, uh, specifically um, to that point where we want to to update, um, you know, something. Ashley, um, do you have a contract? <laughs> I have a contract. Do I implement the contract? No. Every time I try mm -hmm. to get it going, it just feels stuffy and just 
I don't, mm. I don't like the vibe. I just, I don't, I feel like I need one. Absolutely. Mm. But I just can't pull the trigger on it. Nate, I cut you off. What were you going to say? I'm sorry. Um, I was going to say that um, Ashley is an amazing doctor and we should just follow <laughs> her lead. Oh, stop it. I'm, I'm in awe of you, Nate, my, my fellow gator over there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have some, uh, okay, so do you do an informed consent form is a question we have from our audience. Nate, what do you think? Um, so yes, uh, there's a, I mean, we say quite a lot verbally, but there's specifically an informed consent. Uh, well, a part of the contract is the uh, inform, informed consent, you know, so, so they have to do quite a bit of, I mean, it's not quite like buying a house, but it, I mean, you know, <laughs> they do a lot of initialing, they do some signing, you know, there's some, you know, there's some understanding, um, you know, and every parent's different. The vast majority of them feel really comfortable and they trust us. So they kind of, kind of skim it and they're like, yeah, okay, you know, this is fine. A couple of them will, you know, um, this, this point, like we need to talk about this point and then this point, you know, and that's fine. If they want to do that, then I want them to be comfortable. And if they're not comfortable, then I don't want them to do it. Um, so, um, you know, that, you know, honestly, I feel like, I guess we've refined that to the point, you know, where so much of that happens with the, you know, uh, myopia coordinator, um, very little gets back to me nowadays. So I don't hmm. spend as much time thinking about that part as I used to. Ashley, do you guys have informed consent or is that part no, of your contract? We, we don't. We have a checklist of items that we verbally go over that we send, we send home a document with them, but we're not having them sign anything mm -hmm. specifically. You know, I've heard from some, uh, you know, myopia management specialists that do use a contract or, and informed consent is that they will often also have the child initial mm -hmm. next to certain portions of it to kind of infer the importance uh, uh, and responsibility of what's happening. And I'm wondering, you know, I, I, I want to put that out there and I'm wondering if that's uh, something that other docs would be interested in doing. I want to get to a couple more questions before we hand you it over to You know what's funny our... about that, Matt, real quick? Yeah, sure. We've done that with vision therapy for years. There's like the real agreement that the parents sign. And then there's a little small one, separate one, separate page that it's just about, you know, them taking ownership of their vision problem and their understanding that they have to participate in whatever. And I've literally never thought about doing the same thing for myopia control hmm. until you mentioned it. So now I'm <laughs> going to think about that. Well, let me mention something else. What do you guys think about um, brochures? Do you guys have in-office brochures for ortho -K and myopia management? Mm -hmm. And if you do, have you ever thought about doing one specifically for kids? Uh, Nate, what do you think? Um, so we, we absolutely do have uh, brochures. You know, we've tried different things. We have, you know, we, we're kind of going through this period where we're really trying to simplify things, although we're not totally successful at that, but that's our, that's our ambition. Um, I've never thought about that. I have a hard time imagining a kid caring, <laughs> um, unless maybe you know it was made of chocolate or something. <laughs> you know, some some something where they could. Um, but um, you know, as we were you know talking you know previously, this is where the creativity mm. of doing this specialty comes in because now we're, we're, we're like intersecting many different points. We're talking about compliance. We're talking about education. You know, we're, we're talking about the patient. We're talking about the parent and then the form or, you know, whatever, whatever that takes. Um, you know, I think it's absolutely a great idea to, you know, to pursue, but um, we, haven't done that but mm -hmm. I, I think it's 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 absolutely worth worth trying mm -hmm. uh, i think i think as much as possible it, the, the more you can communicate directly with the patient the best that's the main reason why i like tiktok so much is because i know that it's literally kids mm -hmm. watching it parents too but you know that's it's the only avenue where i feel like that actually you know happens so so maybe there's something to that mm -hmm. 
you know, Ashley, Nate brought up, um, you know, the creativity and, and I, I know you agree with this because we've talked about it previously, but it's one of the things I love about myopia management and doctors who do it is that it kind of gives them this like uh, reinvestment of passion in what they're doing and that creativity. And I, Ashley, I was wondering if you could give us like an example uh, of like how you could apply your creativity to your practice and how myopia management enables you to do that. Sure. So you have to really find a way to connect with kids. And I told myself I wasn't going to tell this story, but I think <laughs> it, it may be a good one. So I have this one particular kid. I saw him yesterday. And, it, and so now he's 16. I've been seeing him since he was eight. Um, and he was a very progressive myope. He needed to be in myopia management, but he dug his heels in. He was not wearing contacts. The mom was completely just sitting in the corner, you know, I'm begging for her help to get me to, you know, motivate this kid. And she's like, I have nothing for you. So I asked him, what's your favorite thing? And what's your favorite thing? And he's like, Oreos. I said, what can I do with Oreos? Is there anything I can do to get, to motivate you to wear these contacts? He goes, you can buy me a pack of Oreos every year. If I wear my contacts, I'm like, okay. So for four years straight, when he came in the week before his, his visit, his mom would call me and remind me that I owed her kid a pack of Oreos. <laughs> but for four years straight, I bought him a pack of Oreos. If he brought in his opened boxes, because um, at the time he was wearing a monthly lens um, with his little empty blister packs. And that was our deal. Um, and you, the mm -hmm. funny thing is I thought about another component to the story is that his mom is a life coach. So oh. she could not get her own kid <laughs> to wear contacts, but a pack of Oreos did it. And I know that's just a silly, simple story, but little things it. go really far with kids. You just meet them where they're at and you'd be surprised when I motivate a kid to do something mm -hmm. monumental. I love that. I, I love that story. Thank you for sharing it. Of course. Uh, Nathan, how, how, you know, how do you express your creativity in your practice? Um, I, I think for us, it's a lot more in that, um, you know, interpersonal, uh, you know, relationship, you know, trying to, uh, you know, make notes or ideally remember mm -hmm. specific things like, oh, hey, I had that, I had that tournament go or, you know, oh, I know you guys were going to, you know, you're going skiing over, over break, you know, tell me, you know, you know, tell me about it, you know, and that's, I don't think there's anything, you know, magic or mind blowing about that. I think all great doctors, you know, you know, do that. But I think when you see patients, you know, uh, you know, eight times over the course of, of a year, you can take that to a, a whole, you know, a whole different level, you know, um, and, and, and I think that, that we, you know, I think we do that, you know, a, a lot. I do think that, um, you know, it's, it's great because uh, eventually the patients will start to bring us um, little gifts, like they'll hmm. bring little like tiny Lego creations and I'll be like, oh, that's so fantastic. And I'm going to put it over here with the other ones you know, they'll, you know, they'll bring in little pictures that they drew of, or them, write you something, lines, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so we'll, you know, you know, we'll hang that up. And, you know, the, um, um, the vision therapist, they get all the great stuff, the homemade cookies. And, you know, we don't, we don't <laughs> usually get that level of, of stuff. Um, but, um, but I, I think that, I think for us, that's, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of where it, Advice. Gotcha. All right. Well, we're going to hand it over to our clinical corner soon, but I want to give our panelists an opportunity to, uh, you know, we'll start with Ashley. If anybody has any follow-up or questions or wants to learn more about you and what's going on with you, where can they find information about you on the internet? Sure. So I don't me to just chat, like type my email in the chat. Maybe we'll do that. If you want to. Yeah. Or you can sure. say it out loud. Whatever yeah. You so do. my email, it's Pretty, I'll give you my, my easy one. So it's Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y dot W dot Tucker at gmail.com. Again, I'll, I'll type that. And I would welcome any questions, just like Nate and, and Matthew, of course. We love myopia management. Mm -hmm. and we, we love empowering each other. We're, we're in this together. No competition, nothing. Let's just get this done. And one myope at a time. Yes, definitely. I, I I love that. There's a there's very much a a colleague, not competitor mentality. There's plenty of myopes to go around. Mm -hmm. This the myopia epidemic is real. So like let's not fight against each other. Let's all work together. Uh Nate, where can people find out more information about you on the internet? So uh you can find out um 
lots of information about us and our, our practices at brighteyestampa.com. You can email me directly uh, at doc at brighteyestampa.com. That seemed like such an elegant email address when we only had four staff members. You know, I was, I mean, I was the doctor. And so that was like totally fine. Now it seems, I don't know, kind of obnoxious, I guess. But um, anyways, doc at brighteyestampa.com. That's how you reach me. All right. Okay. So for our panelists, we're going to turn our cameras off and mute our microphones. And then I'm going to handle, hand it over to uh, Dr. Shelby Leach and Dr. Leah Johnson. So go ahead and introduce Dr. Shelby Leach. Dr. Shelby Leach received her Doctor of Optometry degree from University of California, Berkeley in 2017. Upon graduation, she completed a residency at UC Berkeley in pediatrics primary care, where she received advanced training in pediatrics, infant vision, children with disabilities, primary care, and myopia control. Dr. Leach joined SUNY College of Optometry faculty in July of 2018. She currently supervises third and fourth years in the primary care pediatrics, infant vision care, and children with special needs clinics. And she's going to give us some great clinical tips. Uh, Shelby, welcome to the program. I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to go over, oh, it says host disabled participant. Oh, sorry. Let me sorry. share a screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the last thing that I, I forget yeah. to do. Okay, there, there go. should be good. Perfect, thank you. Okay, full screen. All right, so I only, unfortunately, was able to catch kind of the tail end of this discussion we had tonight. I was in evening clinic until a little bit later. Um, so a few things will be re-emphasized because as the doctors um, just said, there are, you know, it's teamwork. We have a, a big job to do in tackling myopia. And so I think a lot of these you cannot hear enough. So my first tip is to choose an appropriate modality. So before you even start talking with the family, you want to take their, uh, the child's prescription into consideration when you start reviewing the treatment options. So just as a review, ortho -K is by far the most limiting in terms of which patients are eligible. So a sphere up to minus six or cell up to minus 175. Now, say if you're doing a Paragon CRT dual axis lens, you may be able to do a little bit of a higher um, astigmatism. Some patients are really want, you know, at least to see mostly clear, say if they're a swimmer. And so even though they're minus eight, they might be okay with that. And then you just correct the rest of it with low minus glasses over the top. But once they really start getting around a minus five, minus 550, I usually don't present ortho K as an ideal option. Um, then multifocal soft lenses, no uh, maximum in terms of myopia. And then unless you're doing a toric multifocal, really about to 150 is your ideal. Some patients are better blur interpreters than others. And so you may be able to get away with it. I generally use a threshold of about 2030 vision um, to achieve if, as long as they can achieve mm -hmm. that without going into a toric, then it's a good option as well. And atropine has no, uh, uh, limits in terms of prescription. Um, obviously, really the main one is if they're allergic to atropine. Parents all the time will ask, what's the best treatment option? Which one should I do? Tell me which one to do. And I really just let them know that the most effective option is going to be the one that they adhere to best. Um, talking about their lifestyle, I'll talk a little bit later about really getting to know the patient, getting their trust, but you want to learn what their activities are, what they do, and that can help guide the family's decision. Um, one big thing I will let the family know, especially if the patient is younger, they'll say, oh, my, my kid is only you know, five, six, seven years old. They're not ready for contact lenses. Well, ortho K, since it's all done at home, is a really big draw for a lot of families. They're not worried about if the kid is going to school or going to sports. Um, you know, they can see clearly during the day without, without anything. And so it can be um, a really nice option, even for kids as young as five. So my second tip is to gain the patient's trust. Uh, you wanna find something in common. I write things down in the chart all the time because I unfortunately have a terrible memory. And so I think it was Nate that, uh, that mentioned that to write things down, ask him about the trip. I have a patient who's a competitive swimmer. So asking how his meat went, super important. He just lights up about it. 
um, any interest that they have as well. You can really um, connect with them on that. And then I usually raise the chair up again if they're, you know, a, a smaller kid, raise them up so they're eye level. So there's a little bit less of a power dynamic and they feel a little bit more comfortable in trusting you. You wanna ensure the patient is motivated, whether it's like Ashley, a pack of Oreos per year. Um, I have definitely um, bribed patients a little bit, but maturity should align with the option treatment chosen more than the age. So again, a lot of parents will say, oh, is my child you know, old enough for contact lenses? And I'll let them know more than age, it's about maturity. Um, I'd say on average, I start considering ortho -K around five years old, again, because the parents are usually the ones putting them in and taking them out. Soft lenses is usually more around seven to eight years old because they have to at least be able to take out the lenses. If they're at school, their eyes bothering them, they need to be able to wash their hands, fill up their case and take out their lenses, put on their glasses. So again, maturity more than age, um, but you have some leeway there. Um, so use incentives, stickers are huge in our clinic. Um, at Berkeley as a resident, we had snacks, which was great. So we had, you know, a thing of, uh, the Fruit Loops or Cheerios and with our little cup, if, you know, if they were hesitant to even guess the letters, we'd use that. So just a little pediatric tip in general, those can be very, very motivating. And of course, with parent permission, um, a lot of parents usually are okay with it, but you always want to make sure that before you say, especially if you do a snack, but even stickers, let them know, like, is it okay if I give them, you know, tiny little stickers as a reward? So you're going to work with the parents and guardians. Everyone needs to be on board with the treatment, know what's going on. Um, as much as you think the child's responsible, they're likely to forget to either take their drop or maybe put their contact lenses in the morning. So everyone needs to be familiar. Myopic parents do tend to buy in easiest in terms of treatment. You know, they're, they'll say, oh, I wish that I had this treatment when I was young. So for the most part, they don't take a ton of convincing. However, for parents who never had to wear glasses or maybe only wear reading glasses, they don't really understand what the world kind of looks like. And so demoing is, is a really, really um, great option. Again, I'll do this even in the, in the normal pediatrics clinic uh, if the parents isn't really understanding the importance of full-time glasses wear. And so I'll show plus lenses to demo, okay, this is their prescription they're at now. This is what they see without any uh, glasses or contacts. And then you can show, you know, next year, if they don't go on any treatment, this is what it's gonna look like. Education on myopia starts early. Um, if you're in a primary care clinic and you're seeing patients who are starting a family, who are trying to start a family and they're myopic, it's never too early to bring it up um, let them know, you know, the potential consequences that it's going to be something that they'll likely have to consider. Keeping up to date with standard of care, um, you guys I know talked a little bit about informative sheets. These are fantastic. I'd rather my patients hear from sources we've given them um, about whether it's effectiveness, um, consequences are, you know, you know, potential implications of wearing contact lenses, those types of things. I'd rather them hear it from us than from Dr. Google. Um, in our clinic, we do offer them in English, Spanish, and Mandarin. And so if you're able to do so, depending on your patient base, that's really great so that they're, they feel comfortable um, um, knowing. Additionally, really offering your patients translational services, um, interpretation services. We want our patients to thoroughly know what they're getting into. Um, we want to make them feel comfortable. And so using their um, native language through an interpreter is really important. You want to be able to answer the family's questions with confidence. So knowing the statistics and making recommendations based on the literature is really going to make you stand apart from some of your colleagues. If you know, you know, you can answer their questions about, oh, what if this happens or this happens or how will I know? Those types of things can um, really ensure the family puts their trust in you. Some resources in order to keep up to date with things. Um, the International Myopia Institute is really great. Hopefully you guys have heard of them. If not, sign up on their website to become a member so you can stay up to date with things. Um, it's free. They come out with white papers every so often. These are fantastic. I recommend you go, do you download them all, you read them. They range from the literature summarizing it, what we know right now, to patient education, to um, you know, what you're supposed to do in the chair, all different types of things that really um, are easy to read and really informative. 
Additionally, the uh, website review of myopia management. I go here often to see, you know, they'll summarize the latest articles. They'll interview people who are doing a lot of myopia research or um, practicing a lot of myopia management. And so I use this resource a lot. And then of course we have our, oops, sorry, we have our conferences. Um, Vision by Design, I went during residency and I really, really enjoyed it. And then GSLS does have uh, quite a bit of uh, material, presentations, posters, everything on myopia management as well. And lastly, keep expectations realistic. It's always better. I mean, really with any treatment that you're doing, it's better to under. Uh, you don't want to let, you know, make them believe that their myopia is going to halt and stop right where they are. And so with that, every child is different and responses will vary for each treatment. I have parents come in and say, oh, my neighbor, my cousin, this, that, they are on the ortho K lens and this is what they did. Um, you know, first you have to make sure that their child is even eligible for an ortho K lens before we even get started. And so again, keeping their expectations in check and letting them know that it's a multi-year commitment that could require change or addition in treatment. As we learn more, things are changing. Um, you can tell in our clinic who was started before LAMP, the LAMP2 study came out, they're on 0.01%. Now we're starting everybody at least on 0.02. Um, so again, there'll be changes. It will be a long process, but it will be worth it. So just setting these expectations from the beginning will be really useful. All right, Leah, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Leach, um, for sharing all those pediatric clinical tips. Um, with here with Cooper Vision Specialty Eye Care, I just want to share with you all on some more opportunities you have. If you enjoyed listening to tonight's webinar on pediatric management for myopia, we also have a myopia management mentorship program with Dr. Matthew Martin. And this is going to be next week um, or in a week and a half, March 24th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And just as Dr. Tucker and uh, Dr. Bonilla Warford talked about, you know, referrals and charging for consultations, um, we're going to have Dr. Matthew Martin talked about how to get those referrals, right? Um, and how to find those myopia management patients. And so you can scan this QR code here on the lower left hand corner if you want to sign up for that webinar. And if you have not yet gotten your IC certification, you can also scan on the lower right hand um, QR code to get your IC certification. It will take you to our website with orthokportfolio.com to get started on IC, which is a customizable ortho K lens. And so we also have on the next slide um, some uh, resources for your patients that you have in practice. Um, first of all, you can refer them to the gpspecialist.com website, and this is a website specifically to help educate your uh, patients and their parents on nearsightedness, why is nearsightedness so important, and to explain to them about myopia management. And if you are a practitioner, once you have your IC certification, you can also scan this QR code on the right side to order marketing materials um, for your patient. So as Shelby had mentioned, um, you know, with you know, utilizing different brochures and resources and educational materials to pass on to the parents, um, we have created a lot of these resources for you. And so with that, thank you so much, everyone, for joining tonight's webinar. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Drs. Leach and Johnson. And well, that's it for this episode of the Knowns and Unknowns of Myopia Management and other cool stuff in optometry. And so I'd like to thank Drs. Benia Warford, Tucker, Johnson, and Leach. And I'd also like to thank GP specialists for believing in this program. This has been a great uh, series, uh, wonderful six episodes. And I'd like this to be like our season one, right? I'd like to see more of this happen in the future. So wherever you're consuming this content, whether it be on a podcast or on YouTube or whatever the case may be, leave a comment. Say, I'd like to see season two of the knowns and unknowns or go to aaomc.org. Uh, you can become a member there uh, for free. We also have a paid membership. Uh, you know, send us an email and say, hey, I'd like to see more of this program. So I'd also like to thank uh, Louise Curcio, who's been uh, a huge portion of this program she hasn't been on camera she's been uh, a huge part of the support of this program designing it 
and has been working with me and Dr. Johnson every step of the way. And so, Louise, thank you so much for being a part of this. And of course, I want to thank Chris Jeffries and Mark Cosgrove. And I also want to thank Consumac for their support of this program. So, uh, you know, for all of our listeners and viewers around the world, thank you for attention and hopefully we'll see you at the next one. All right.